uh, one of the, uh, the great joys of being the pastor of this church is uh, really just the, the godliness of this congregation. Um, I was talking to a brother tonight and just was grateful, just reminded again about how good God has been to our church in bringing so many godly men and women uh, to our congregation. It really is astounding uh, how many people love the Lord and love his word and want to serve each other. Uh, and one of the joys I have as a pastor is, um, you know, with our internship program is just reading uh, four or five books a semester uh, with, with folks who want to grow deeper in, in their spiritual walk. Uh, and my, our internship this past semester with Daniel Huddleston, with um, Daniel Truesdale, um, uh, Terrell Stauffer and, and David Huddleston kind of sat in that in those meetings as well, uh, was extremely edifying. Uh, every time uh, we'd get together, we would talk about the scriptures, we'd talk about books we'd be reading, and I just saw tremendous growth. Uh, and I just saw tremendous growth uh, in, in Daniel uh, Truesdale and his care for um, the Word of God, uh, his care uh, not only for the Word of God, but the things of God and how he chooses to live his life. So uh, I know that he has put much uh, time and effort uh, into his preparation uh, for tonight, and I know you'll be blessed and encouraged uh, by his uh, bringing the word. So let me just uh, pray for him briefly, and I'm sure he'll come back up here and, and get himself settled and pray again. Uh, I just uh, ask now, Father, that you would bless my brother uh, Daniel. I pray that you would uh, calm his nerves. I pray that he, when he uh, stands before your people, that you would fill him with unction of the Holy Spirit, uh, that the power that he preaches with is not of himself, but is of you. Allow him to rest fully and confidently on the word of God. Uh, we pray that you would use him as your tool, as your servant, to edify and strengthen your saints. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. Hope everybody had a Merry Christmas and that your New Year's going good so far. And um, if you want to go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 3, um, our text tonight is going to be Hebrews 3, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> and um, before we look at our text tonight, I want us to be reminded that God is our hope. And that anything else we place our hope in will fail us. Ephesians 2 tells us that before we came to Christ, that we were dead in our sins, that we were children of wrath, that at that time we were separated from Christ, having no hope and without God in the world. But thankfully, God didn't leave us without any hope. But in his great love, he sent his only son that we might live through him. And that's the, the hope that we celebrated at Christmas. And that's the hope that we cling to every day of the year. And um, so this new year with all the joys and the sorrows that it might bring, the difficulties, the blessings, um, just, just rest in God, you know, and in the hope that we have in Christ. Um, but as we look at um, Hebrews 3, 1 through 6, I hope that as we go through these scriptures and other verses that we'll look at tonight, that, that you'll see that it's all because of Christ, who he is, and what he's done for us. So um, this text is written to believers in Christ, but if there's anyone here tonight that, that's not a believer in Christ and you've yet to trust Christ, um, you know, first of all, we're glad that you're here, and we pray that as you hear God's word, that, that he'll open your heart to, to respond in faith. And that before you leave tonight, that you will trust in Christ. So Hebrews 3, 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boast and our hope. Um, let's pray before we get started. Father, I love you. God, I thank you for your kindness, Lord. God, I thank you, Lord, even as Brother Grant prayed with me that, that you use broken people, God, and, and every one of us, Lord, have at one time 
We've been broken in our sins. God, and lost and undone without Christ. And God, we thank you, Lord, in your mercy, God, that you sent your Son. God, that you've given us life in Christ. And God, we just thank you, Lord, that um, for all that you've done in our lives. And God, I pray that tonight that you'll help me, God, enable me by your Spirit, God. Um, give me grace, Lord, to, to speak your word, God, to, to stay tethered to your word, as Pastor Gary would say. Um, and God, I pray above all that you would be glorified, that Christ would be magnified. And Lord, that you would be magnified in the hearts of, of your people, Lord, that they would treasure and esteem and, and hold Christ higher in their hearts when they leave tonight before they got here. And Lord, if there's any lost here, I pray, God, open their hearts. So they'd respond in faith and trust Christ tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the main themes of the book of, of Hebrews are the supremacy of the Son over all things and the completeness of the redemption that he's purchased for us, for his people. And also we see time and time again the exhortation you know, to not draw back but to stand firm in the faith and to persevere in trials and whatever difficulties that we face. And you know, as we go through this text, you know, we'll notice... A lot of those themes tonight. But starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, holy brothers. And to see why the author addresses these believers as holy brothers, we just had to look back to chapter 2 and verse 17, where he says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might be... I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong verse. <laughs> we just had to look back to chapter 2, verse 11, which says, For he who sanctifies... And those who are sanctified all have one source. Now, the, the he who sanctifies is Jesus. And those who are sanctified are those who place their faith in Jesus. And the one source is God the Father. So we see, we'll look first that Jesus is the one who sanctifies, who makes us holy. We're going, to, we're going to look at three ways that Jesus sanctifies us. He sanctifies us by his blood, by the word, and by his spirit. So we are, first, we're sanctified through his blood. Hebrews 13, 12 says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. And Hebrews 10, 10 tells us that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Through his sacrifice, we're made holy and consecrated to God. Through his blood, we're sanctified. Through his blood, also, we're, we're justified Romans 5, 9 says, We've now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Apart from Christ, we're all guilty before God. We're all rightly condemned because of our sins. But through the blood of his cross, he's reconciled us to God. He's made peace between us and God through the sacrifice he made on the cross. So if we've placed our faith in Christ, we're no longer guilty. We're no longer condemned. But he's made us holy. He's made us holy and righteous in his sight in Christ. We also see through his blood we have redemption, forgiveness, and cleansing. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We've not been redeemed with corruptible things, but we've been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Not only do we have redemption through his blood, but we have forgiveness and cleansing. As 1 John 1, 7 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. Not only does Jesus sanctify us through his blood, but we're sanctified through the word. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus uses the word of God to sanctify his people. And you know that's why it's so important for us to spend personal time every day in God's word. Even as Pastor Dave encouraged the church in the email, you know, that that we need to recommit ourselves this year, this year to reading God's Word. And there's nothing more that the enemy wants than for God's people to neglect the Word of the Lord. 
So with God's help this year, let's recommit ourselves. Let's be determined that we're going to spend time with God in his word so we can grow, so, we be, so that we can be sanctified and cleansed with his word. And um, I just love the, the dedicatory page of the, the King James Bible. They, they speak of God's word and they say, God's sacred word, that inestimable treasure which excelleth all the riches of the earth. Oh, that we would have that kind of esteem for God's word. And as me and Pastor Gary were talking about Asher, my little boy the other day, um, he was talking about how as newborn babies that we're supposed to desire the sincere milk of the word. You know, whenever I watch my son, whenever he gets hungry, he's such a, he's, he's like a perfect baby. I know that that's not such thing, but if there ever was one, he's a perfect baby. But, um, but like, you know, about the only time he cries is when he's hungry. You know what I mean? And it's the funniest thing I know that y'all have all seen a newborn baby whenever he's hungry. And, you know, they just, they're going crazy. I mean, they're just jerking and shaking and, you know, just going crazy until you give them that bottle. And that's how God says that as newborn babies that we should hunger and thirst after his word in that way. And also knowing that Jesus sanctifies us through his word, it also shows why it's so important that we're in God's house. Because it's in God's house, God has ordained the church to be the place where we come and we hear God's word and we're built up and we grow up in the likeness of Christ. You know, and God has given us as a gift, pastors and teachers that are gifted to teach God's word. And so we need to be in God's house so we can grow up, so we can grow up in the Lord, so we can be sanctified by his word. And I encourage you that, that, you know, probably most everybody here, you know, comes to part. But if you don't have a church that you faithfully attend, I encourage you this year, make this year the year that you find a good Bible-believing church that honors Christ, that honors his word, and, and get in there, you know, and so you can grow and be built up in him. And so not only does Jesus sanctify us through his blood and through the word, but we're sanctified by the spirit of God. 1 Peter 1, 1 1-2 says that we are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. Sanctification is a work of the Spirit of God. And we see in God's Word that our sanctification was planned by God before He ever created the world. As Ephesians 1, 4 says, God chose us in Him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. And Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God has predestined us. He's chosen us as his people to be sanctified, to be holy, and to be conformed day by day into the image and likeness of Christ his Son. And not only is this a process which we'll go through from the time that we trust Christ through every day of our lives, but finally that work of sanctification will be complete when as, it, when as in 1 John 3, 2 it says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he, as he is. And not only has God chosen us to be holy, but he's chosen us to be his children. And that's why the text says, therefore, holy brothers. And looking again at um, chapter 2, verse 11 he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. The one source is God the Father. And we are brothers with Christ and with one another. Jesus is the eternal, only begotten Son of God. And we are all sons of God, adopted sons of God, through faith in Christ. As Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus became like one of us, taken on our flesh and blood, identified himself with us so that we could become sons of God. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God. I mean, what love that God's shown to us that we should be called children of God. What a high privilege that we as vile sinners, that in Christ that we would become sons and daughters of God. We were slaves, but now we're sons. We're fellow heirs with Christ. And um, all because Jesus, the eternal Son of the Father, took on our flesh in order to deliver us. I'm moving on in our text. Um, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, we're able to share in this calling because Christ shared in our flesh and blood. And not only that, but this calling is something that we as believers in Christ 
that we share in. It's something we're companions together in this call. And this calling is supposed to be something that unifies us as believers. As Ephesians 4 says, that we're to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called, maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. So this calling, this hope we have, and our calling is something that should unify us in Christ. And notice this calling is a heavenly calling. We are called from heaven to heaven. So looking at 2 Timothy 1.9, we'll look at this calling from heaven. It says, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. God is the one who has called us. Now what does this call from heaven do? First, it calls us out of darkness. 2 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. God has delivered us from the domain of darkness. He set us free from our bondage to sin and Satan. We're to no longer be conformed to the passions of our former ignorance, as 1 Peter 1, 14 to 15 says, but as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all your conduct. And Ephesians says that we were once darkness, but now we're light in the Lord, so walk as children of light. We're no longer to walk in the ignorance that we were once in, but we're to walk in light, to walk as children of light. And not only does this call from heaven call us out of darkness, but it brings us into the light. And in the Bible, sometimes darkness um, symbolizes ignorance and blindness to the truth. And light signifies understanding and knowledge. And this heavenly calling brings us out of darkness, out of our spiritual ignorance and darkness. And it brings us into the light, into the knowledge of Christ. And 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This call brings us to the knowledge of Christ. So how does this call come to us? You know, how do we receive this understanding and come to the knowledge of Christ? It's only by His Spirit and by His Word. In Acts 16, 14, when Lydia heard Paul preaching the word of the Lord, it says that the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. So we see Lydia, she's, you know, Paul's preaching and Lydia hears the word of God. And then it says the Lord, as she hears the word of God, the Lord opens her heart and she responds to the word of God. She responded to the things spoken by Paul. And so it's the, same, it's the same way with us when we hear the word of God and the Lord opens our heart to respond in faith to the word of God and to Christ. That's a picture of the heavenly calling. And 1 Corinthians 1, 23 to 24 says, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we see here, like Paul is preaching Christ, Christ crucified, and the word's going out. And the Jews, to the Jews, it's it's a stumbling block to them. And, And to the Greeks, it's foolishness. But there's another group, those who are called. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's the call of God that makes the difference. So that's the way that we've received the glorious message of Christ because we've been called by God. And by this call we've come to treasure Christ above all things. You know, we're like in, in Matthew 13, 44, the man who found a treasure hidden in a field. And it says that in his joy he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. And that's the way it is with us. Whenever our eyes are open and we see who Christ is, we see the beauty and the glory of the Son, then we're, as Paul said in Philippians 3.8, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Not only is this calling a call from heaven, but it's a call to heaven. In this life we have hope in Christ. 
But this isn't our ultimate hope in this life. Our ultimate hope is to be with Christ where he is in heaven. As Paul says in Philippians 1, 21 to 24, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Paul's greatest hope and desire was to be with Christ where he is, and that should be our greatest hope and desire. We have a living hope, as 1 Peter says, an inheritance in heaven is reserved in heaven for us. On this earth, we're just strangers and exiles. This world's not our home. But it says in Hebrews eleven sixteen that we desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. We're seeking a homeland where we belong, a heavenly country. May we set our hearts toward heaven where Christ is. As Paul said in Colossians 3, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. All of our hope is in Christ. And to be with him, to be where Christ is, is our heart's desire. Which leads us to the next part of our text. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. All right, I moved a page. <laughs> consider Jesus. Um, consider Jesus in your trials. Um, whatever you may be going through, and whatever trials, whatever dif difficulties and temptations you're facing, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Consider him. You know, the, the, the writer to the Hebrews, the, the Hebrew believers were, were facing fierce persecution and strong persecution because of their faith. And many of them were tempted, I'm sure, to draw back. That's why they were continually exhorted to not draw back, but to continue in the faith. And so there may be, when we're going through hard times or we're going through things we don't understand, we might sometimes be tempted to draw back. But I want us to look at John 6, 67 through 69, which is some of my favorite verses, where Jesus said to the 12 disciples, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. When you're tempted to, to give up or turn back, I hope that your heart will respond, Lord, where are we going to go? To whom shall we go? Christ is our life. Christ is our hope. Where else are we going to go? Maybe tonight you're discouraged or you're lonely. You know, consider how much that Jesus loves you. You know, whenever you lie down in your bed at night and maybe it feels empty and dark and cold, know that he's there with you. When you rise up in the morning, he's still there. Throughout the day, Whatever, wherever you go, whatever you do, he's there with you, watching over you with loving care. And consider Jesus for what greater thing is there in heaven and earth, you know, to set our, mind, to set our minds on, to meditate on, than the Lord Jesus. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You know, and is there, any, is there anything or anyone more just or more true than the Lord Jesus? Is there anyone that is more pure or more lovely than the Lamb of God? Is there anyone more worthy of honor and praise than Jesus? And is there anyone... Is there anything else that we as children of God could set our minds on or think on that would bring us any greater delight than to think about the Son of God? And as we consider Jesus, as we think about him, our hearts will be stirred to love him more. And as we love him more, we'll desire to obey him and honor him in everything that we think and say and do. And moving on to the next part, it says, Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, I know at first it, it can seem kind of funny, you know, thinking like Jesus is the apostle, you know, because this, this is actually the only place in the Bible that Jesus is referred to as the apostle. And um, whenever you look at what the word apostle means, it actually makes a lot of sense because the, an apostle is just a sent one. It's one who's sent, you know, one who's sent on a mission. And, 
you know, so whenever we think about that, it makes a lot of sense because when we look at Galatians 4 to, 4, 4 to 5, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And also in John three sixteen to 17, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. So we see that Jesus was sent by God the Father to redeem and to save those who would believe in him. God sent his Son on a rescue mission to save ruined sinners, lost and undone. The reason Jesus came was to seek and to save those who were lost and to give his life as a ransom for many. If in your heart tonight, if God reveals to you that you're lost, you know, just know, just know that he came to seek and to save you. He came to give his life as a ransom for you. And he will save you if you turn from your sins and you put your trust in Christ and in Christ alone. He will save you. As the old hymn says, only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Not only was Jesus sent in order to redeem and save those who would believe, but Jesus was sent to glorify God the Father. In John 17, 4, Jesus prayed, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And in John 12, 27 to 28, while Jesus was thinking upon how he would die, he said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. God was glorified in Jesus' life, and everything that he did, he perfectly obeyed his Father and always did the things that pleased him. Everything that Jesus did in his earthly life was for the glory of God. And that's the way that the Bible says that we're to live our lives, that everything that we do, whatever we, whether we eat or whether we drink, that whatever we do, we're to do all to the glory of God. Not only was, Jesus glorif not only was God glorified in Jesus' life, but he was glorified in Jesus' death and resurrection. In the crucifixion, God's attributes were gloriously on display. We see God's holiness, justice, and wrath displayed when on the cross, as all our sins were placed upon Jesus, the holy God executed his divine justice and wrath upon his only son who hung there in our place. And never has there been a greater display of God's love and mercy than when God gave his only son for vile sinners like us. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 8, 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. That's love incomprehensible, that God would give his only son, that he would give him up for us all. Vile sinners, rebellious, who were haters of God, didn't want anything to do with God, but yet he loved us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And also in the resurrection, we see God's power was displayed. Ephesians 1 speaks of God's mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And as Jesus said, that, that, he, that he had the power to lay his life down, and he had the power to take it up again. But not only is God glorified in the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but he's also glorified in what that life, death, and resurrection has accomplished and that's the salvation of sinners. The same power that raised Christ from the dead raised us who were dead in our sins, raised us to new life in Christ. And because salvation is a gift and there's nothing that we can do to earn it, God gets all the glory. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Not only is Jesus the apostle, but our text says that he's the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. As high priest, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Hebrews 7, 26 to 28 says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, 
holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. So notice that Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice, but also that this is a once for all sacrifice. God the Father appointed Jesus, the holy, innocent, unstained, and exalted Son of God, to be the high priest who would offer himself as the once for all sacrifice to take away the sins of his people. As Hebrews 10, 11, 14 says, and every high priest, and every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now the priests of the Old Covenant, they had to offer sacrifices daily, first for their own sins, and then for the sins of the people. But Christ, who had no sin of his own, he was able to offer one sacrifice for all time. And their sacrifices could never take away sins. But as it says in the Gospel of John, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus is able to take away all of our sins. In the holy place of old, there was no place for the priest to sit down because his work was never finished. He had to daily come and to make sacrifices daily for the sins of the people. But when Christ had offered for one time a sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And the reason that he sat down is because as he cried from the cross, it is finished. It is finished. The work is accomplished. And that's why... On the, that's why that it says in verse 17, God says, I will remember their sins no more. He has forever taken away our sins. As the hymn that we sing so often says, My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. And as high priest, not only did Jesus offer himself as the once for all sacrifice, but he rose again from the dead. And that's why it says that in Hebrews 7.25 that he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus died for our sins. He arose from the dead, ascended to the Father, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he ever lives to make intercession for his people. Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest, as Hebrews 2, 17 to 18 says. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And let me just read a quote from the Reformation Study Bible that says, Only one who was tested in every way, as we are, could be the merciful high priest. And only the one who responded to every test in perfect obedience could be the faithful high priest, without sin and worthy to offer himself as the unblemished sacrifice. Jesus is a merciful high priest. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. You know, because he was tempted as we are, he understands, he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses and be a merciful high priest. As Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because we have a merciful high priest, we can come before his throne and receive mercy in our time of need. Also, we see that Jesus is a faithful high priest. He was faithful to his Father in all things. He responded to every test in perfect obedience. 
And in Philippians 2, 6 through 11, we read of Christ's humiliation, which says that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or a thing to be held on to for advantage. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Even as Pastor Dave brought up this morning how he removed his outer garment and he took the form of a servant and he washed the disciples' feet. So Jesus was in the form of God from all eternity, but he removed his outer garment. He emptied himself and took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And it's in this that we see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. As 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says that this is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that, that ye through his poverty might become rich. And then on down, when we finish up um, Philippians, the verse we read in Philippians, we read about his exaltation. It says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So now we're going to, you know, we've just read about the, the humiliation and the exaltation of Christ, and now we're going to turn our attention to the glory of the Son. So in Hebrews chapter 3, in verse 3, it says, who was faithful to him who appointed, in verse 3, sorry. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. So, you know, we're seeing this comparison between Jesus and Moses, and, and Moses was highly honored by the people of Israel. You know, I would say that he was the most revered person in, in Israel's history, and, you know, and rightfully so, because God did many mighty deeds through Moses, and God revealed himself to Moses, you know, in a more intimate way than he did the other prophets. Um, even in Numbers chapter 12, where, which was quoted in our text, where it says that, you know, that he is faithful in all my house. If we look at Numbers 12, we see that Miriam and, Aaron, Miriam and Aaron were speaking against Moses. And they were saying, has the Lord indeed only spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? You know, it's like they were saying, you know, what makes Moses any greater than us? You know, I mean, God's spoken through us just like he's spoken through Moses. So what makes Moses so great? And so because of that, because we're speaking against Moses, you know, God decides that he's going to come down and have a little meeting with Miriam and with Aaron. And so God said to him, it says in Numbers chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, And the Lord came down on a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth or face to face, clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. God let them know that Moses was not just like any of the other prophets. You know, God had revealed himself to Moses in a unique way, and God had given greater authority, um, greater authority and honor to Moses than he did the other prophets. But just as great, you know, as great as Moses was, and as much honor as God gave to Moses, Jesus is far greater and worthy of more honor than Moses. And just as we saw in this verse in Numbers 12 that God made a distinction between Moses and the other prophets, so now God has given preeminence to his son over all. Now, if you'll turn back with me to Hebrews chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse, cha or in verse 1. Hebrews 1, verse 1. It says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, 
through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And now we're going to start to see like God's making this distinction, you know, between you know, the glory of, of angels and the glory of Jesus. Um, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, in verse 6, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. And then going on down to verse 10, speaking of the Son, he says, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe you will roll them up. Like a garment they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies? A footstool for your feet. And I just want to read a few more verses just about how God has honored his son. Colossians 1, 15 to 18 says of the son, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And in the beginning, as Pastor Dave read this morning, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who can compare with the glory of Jesus the Son? You know, as we were looking at Hebrews 3, how does, the, how does the building compare with the builder? You know, Moses was a part of God's house, but Jesus is the builder of God's house. As we read that through him all things were made, that the whole universe and all the ages were fashioned through Christ. They've been built by him, and they're upheld currently by the word of his power. And then also looking at Hebrews 3, how does a servant compare with the son? You know, Moses, it says, was a servant in God's house, but Jesus is the son over God's house. He's been appointed the heir of all things. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Who can compare to the glory of Jesus? He's the image of the invisible God, the exact representation of his being. Who else but Jesus can say of themselves, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he's the eternal word of the Father, revealing and making God known to us. As John 1.18 says, the only son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. You know, who better can reveal God the Father to us but the only Son who has eternally been in the bosom of the Father. And he's the radiance and the brightness of the glory of God. And I love when I'm thinking about this to look at Revelation 21, 22 to 23, when, it's, when John's describing the new Jerusalem where, where one day all of God's people are going to dwell with God. And it says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. He's eternally shown forth the perfections of God the Father. Who can compare with the glory, the splendor, and the majesty of Christ the Son? Who can compare to him? He is altogether lovely. He's the chief among ten thousands, the darling Son of God in whom the Father is well pleased. He's the good shepherd who gave his life for his own. He's the spotless lamb of God who was slain for us. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah 
who alone is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. He's our prophet, our high priest, our now reigning and soon coming king. Who can compare to Jesus, our great God and Savior? Now, people in our day might say, well, what makes Jesus any greater than any other prophet? Or why should I follow Jesus instead of another religion? And in Matthew 16, 13 to 18, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is not just another prophet. He's the son of the living God. And on this confession that Jesus is the son of the living God is how we are a part of his church. And it's on this confession that Jesus is building his church. Jesus is the builder of the house of God, whose house we are. As Ephesians 2.22 says, you are being made into a house or a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. Jesus is, not only the, Jesus is not only the builder of the house, only the builder of God's house, but he is also sovereign over it. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He not only started the construction, but he'll oversee the construction until the day that it's completed. As Paul said in Philippians 1.6, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So looking at the last part of our text, and the last point, it says, the last part of verse 6 in Hebrews 3 says, And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. So I encourage you tonight to, to continue in your faith, to hold fast to the hope, that we have in Christ. And as this text says, that the evidence, that it says we are his house if we, if we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. So our confidence, or I mean our evidence that we are his house and that we belong to him is if we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. But why do we hold fast? You know, when, when others walk away, why does our faith not fail? And I believe the answer is because we have a faithful high priest, a merciful and a faithful high priest who is always praying for us. In Luke 22, 31 to 32, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you so that your faith may not fail. Our hope and our confidence is in Christ and in Christ alone. You know, my hope is not in, in my strength to keep myself, but that I'm kept by the power of God. If we're holding on to Christ, it's because he's holding on to us. As Charles Spurgeon said, it is not your hold of Christ that saves you. It is his hold of you. Let's stand together, and we sang this this morning, but we're going to sing it again. He will hold me fast. 388 in your, your songbook. When I fear my faith.